I've got it. All right. How are we doing, Amy? Um, well, you know, I think it could be safe to, to begin the shindig. All right. I just want to say that um, the printer jammed twice. Mm -hmm. I don't have my script. I'm I'll waiting help you. it. I will help you. First, I need a name. Um, <laughs> Your name is? That's not a good sign. <laughs> Where am I? Your name is Kathy Hattori. Oh, wow. Still? Still. Okay. Amy, are we ready? Yeah. Do you want to count us in? Okay. I don't think I've ever done a physical. Maybe you should do the physical counting. Okay, hold yeah, on. Let's stop being silly. Or not. Ever. Back to serious. Ever. Ever. Just a moment. We are so pro, Kathy. Well, it's the end of the week. week. Now, where have you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Feedback Friday. It is Friday, January 6th. Anniversary is some really significant day, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about our episode 112. And Feedback Friday is the show where we speak with dyers, artists, scientists, writers, scholars, activists, anybody uh, amazing about our favorite topic, which is natural dyeing in color. I'm Kathy Hattori, president of Botanical Colors, alongside Amy Dufo, communications director at Botanical Colors. And we are so pleased to kick off the new year, 2023, with a lineup of incredible and interesting presenters for you. Um, but before we jump into that, I got a little bit of a uh, couple of reminders and some housekeeping. Um, so 2023 is kind of the year where re we are really embracing in real life experiences as well as our online Zoom workshops so that we have maximum flexibility for everybody um, in learning and getting together. And so we have, um, we're hosting a workshop in Seattle this summer with Takayuki Ishii. Um, many of you know him as Aono Yo, and he is uh, going to be teaching uh, both kakishibu, which is the persimmon tannin dyeing, as well as um, he's building a sukumo indigo vat. Um, so that's going to be super interesting because it's freezing here. And um, he's going to build a vat and we're going to be doing uh, sukumo indigo dyeing with certain uh, mostly stitched shibori techniques making the Japanese uh, split curtain called a noren. And so he'll be here doing that. And we're very excited about that. Um, we are also launching with registration opening next Thursday, January 12th, um, a botanical beauty and biodiversity in real life, which means Hawaii folks Woo! Uh, with Sorry. Sasha Durr. <laughs> Sasha, our very, very best friend and astrological twin. Um, is going to be joining us at her new studio in a volcano and on the big island. And um, we're going to be, I don't know, it sounds like we're going to be lolling around eating rambutans. But I think we're also going to be foraging, hiking, um, going to farmer's markets, meeting with local people who are doing sustainable work. Uh, it's going to be pretty incredible. So Sasha, as always, is such a great teacher, and we're going to learn a lot and really immerse ourselves. So we hope you can join us for that. Um, and while we're waiting for the sun to start shining, I'm just going to talk a little bit about housekeeping. Amy's going to be our moderator and uh, monitoring the chat on this call. 
So after the end or near the end of the presentation, she'll open it up for chat and you can ask questions of Maura. And um, we're gonna have everybody muted for the presentation, but we'll open it up after for questions. This call is being recorded. So you'll be able to view the video if you weren't able to make it um, with us live, which is where all the fun happens, but that's okay. It's going to be recorded so you can relive it. Um, so with that, I'm just going to introduce our guest today. Um, we're so pleased to welcome Minneapolis-based fiber and textile artist Moira Bateman. Uh, I met Moira this summer. She attended a workshop with Abu Bakar Fofana. At, with her daughter and um, they were doing just incredible work. And Mara's, Mara's own work takes a deep look at water, sediment and color. She creates assemblages from wax to silk, dyed with tannins and waterway sediments, soaking them for days, months and even years in the waters, mud and, and sediment of rivers, lakes and my most favorite new word, Bogs of Minnesota. Her past collaborative projects with authors, poets, theater makers, and scientists have monitored and documented the conditions of Minnesota's watersheds. So this is going to be really fascinating. I, I know those of you who follow um, along with Amy and my activities know that there has been a lot of focus on water. And it's really, really great that we have Moira here to talk to us about water in Minnesota, land of a thousand lakes or a million lakes or whatever it is that their motto is because there's water for us to be looking at. Um, so without any further ado, I'm just going to seg into the presentation and welcome Moira. Thank you, Moira, and for joining us and welcome to Feedback Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and Amy. And hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you Botanical Colors for having me and I'm I'm really happy to be here with you. I'm gonna do a screen share now. So my education was in landscape architecture and I concentrated on landscape ecology and studio art. My early work were outdoor installations, dealing with plants and other natural materials. About 13 years ago, I transitioned to working on indoor gallery art, and that's when cloth came into my work. It didn't take long for me to want to leave the cloth in the landscape uh, to find my interest in memory and cloth, wanting to figure out if there's a way for the cloth to have the memory of these places. So that's where I started experimenting. Here in this slide, I'm at a remnant prairie in Western Minnesota. So it's never been tilled, uh, it's original prairie. I'm at this vernal pool. So sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's dry. When I left the cloth there, it was wet. And when I came back after about a month in the image in the middle, it had dried out. I'm hoping in the third also photo, you can see the interesting metallic golds and pinks that ended up on the cloth at that site. This is another area of Western Minnesota. It was an oak savanna. And this little lake is called Lake of the Little Tree Spirits. And these images are when I just pulled the cloth out of the lake and put it on the outcropping. That summer, I went to 10 different sites all across the state of Minnesota. Um, one site for each of the 10 landscape ecotypes in the state. I wanted to get a cross section of the landscapes of the state. In 2018, I did a water residency at the St. Croix Watershed Research Station in Marine on St. Croix, Minnesota. And this cloth I left in the St. Croix River that summer. Here are water scientists from the research station. We went out in the research boat and dug up these long tubes, didn't dig them up, I'm sorry. We inserted them into the bottom of the lake and pulled up. Um, these long tubes that represent hundreds of years of deposition of sediment in the lake bottom. And they study it and can tell a lot about climate change and land use management from especially the diatom fossils at each level, because the different numbers and types of diatoms represent um, a lot of things that they can read into it. 
on the right, this amazingly, they gave me this bucket of sediment and I was able to use that in dyeing my fabric. Here are some fabric samples that I dyed in the sediment. I left it in that bucket for months, I think, and it was bubbling and fermenting, which was very interesting. The one on the right is had kind of a pink tone and those interesting black marks. This is a paleolimnologist, Mark Edlund, who specializes in diatoms. And he's looking at the screen there that those are the images that are under the microscope, which is next to him. And I've added some other images from there of uh, diatoms, which are pretty amazing looking, and um, other algae. At this point, I had a, the desire to take these images of uh, microscopic diatoms and algae that are in the sediment and work on creating abstractions in my art on the fabric that I've dyed with that same sediment. This is one of the images that I use to create a piece in my artwork. So you can see on the left is the image that I first had. I played around with it with the orientation and cropping in the center. And on the right is the image that I used in my artwork. On the left is the piece that came directly from that last slide. And on the right, this piece also came from images of algae. We also collected living algae when I was at the research station. And these samples on the left were put through a centrifuge because they're basically harvesting the algae cells out of the water, concentrating it. And they gave me a couple of samples. Those are the ones on the right. And I put them through a single serve coffee press. And these are the coffee filters that filtered out the cells and gave me that color. The color faded. It's really, really lovely, but it faded after about a day. This was another experiment. I wanted to see if I could spread the sediment on the cloth and have it just dye that exact spot. And so I sandwiched the cloth, spread it on there, and I sandwiched the cloth between two pieces of um, plastic. And this is how it turned out. This cloth sat in a bucket in my studio probably for a couple of years. And I just found it when I moved studios. And I actually really love it. And I especially love thinking about the diatom fossils that are basically right there still. Starting in 2019, I did a water residency at the Grand Marais Art Colony on Lake Superior in northern Minnesota. This is the rocky shore of Lake Superior, and I was just experimenting with um, rock rubbings there. I spent much of the residency on the Gunflint Trail, which is a 56-mile-long dead-end road that goes from Grand Marais along the edges of the Boundary Waters canoe area and, and the border of Canada. And in this pond or wetland, I gathered water samples. I had a 1950s microscope with me and I found these algae images in the pond water from the last slide. And it's actually really easy to take photos through the microscope lens with your iPhone or your phone. And that's how I got these images. This is Prune Lake. So it's about halfway up the Gunflint Trail. And I had heard that this lake had a lot of tannins in it and it is a pruney dark color. So I decided to leave fabric in this lake for one year and see what happened. I ended up going here for three years, 2019, 2020, and 2021 to leave and retrieve fabric. This lake is reached um, by canoeing across a much bigger lake and then hiking or portaging through the forest to get here. It's kind of a surprise that there's two rowboats sitting here just in this remote lake for anybody to use. This video is of my uh, August night, sorry, August 2020 trip to Prune Lake. The Grand Marais Art Colony came with me and my fellow water residency artist, poet, and filmmaker Moheb Solomon is the one who made this video. So in the video, I'm retrieving the fabric that I left there in 20, 2019, and I'm leaving fabric that I'm going to come back and get in 2021. It was an odd feeling to go back in 2020, knowing how the world had changed so much since I had been there last, and that the cloth was just sitting there peacefully in this world of the lake when so much turmoil was happening in the human world. Here I'm 
showing the camera, these are the, um, the chum bags with the cloth in it that had been sitting there for the last year since 2019. And then on the right are the bags that I'm gonna leave there and I ended up retrieving in 2021. And here I'm taking the fabric out of the bags and the darkest colors are what was touching probably the bottom of the lake. It got darker colors, it got holes in it. I believe that maybe the microbes in the sediment are what kind of eat those holes away. It's a beautiful little lake with a lot of boggy peatland around it and just a dense spruce tamarack forest. It's right kind of tucked in the, in the boundary waters, but it's not part of the boundary waters. This is the cloth drying at the edge of Poplar Lake, the bigger one, after we canoed back there. This is the cloth after I waxed it back at my studio. And here's a close up of it. You can see some of the markings to me, they almost look bruise like coming through the fabric. And I really love the textures and the crinkles in it. This is even closer up just to see the fibers and the degradation from the action of the water. Now this photo is current. It's uh, buckets of bog mud that I have and small samples of Minnesota clays, all that have some degree of iron content in them. The bog mud is fresh, so it has microorganisms already. Um, the clay on the right, I got from a local potter who collects clay himself, but he had dried it out. So I'm now fermenting that and hoping to be able to use it in a matter similar to <clears throat> the Molly mineral mud dye thanks to Abelbach, Arcofana, and Botanical Colors. This is the area where I found the bog mud. The piece of cloth here was pre-treated with gallo tannin, and it started to turn color as soon as I put it in the water and the muck from the iron. And I put it in a baggie and took it with me when I left, and by the, an hour later, it had already turned purple. And here, here it is when I got it back to my studio. Here's a couple other samples of cloth I've recently dyed in the bog mud. The one on the left um, was with the tannins were from amelanch here and aspen leaves from the bog. And the one on the right was with myrobalan. Here's a close up of the second image from the last slide. And here are more pieces that I've been recently dying in the bog mud. This is my studio, which is also behind me. It shows more pieces that I've been making in the bog mud. Um, the pieces on the wall there are now installed and I'll show you some installation shots at the end. This piece is actually not dyed from mud of any kind. It's, this is the blue black color that I've used for years and it's from um, tannin and iron powder. But I'm experimenting now with the bog mud with different tannins combinations and the age of the tannin to try to get a similar color from bog mud. And here's something completely different I've been doing. I've been making a kayak out of wax silk. And I placed the fabric pieces around the plastic kayak and just stitched them. And I'm using the kayak as a type of mold. The stitching of the kayak has been really cathartic for me. And it's something I really enjoy doing. Here's my studio yesterday. And you can see the kayak, or a few days ago, you can see the kayak in the background hanging by the, the white table. I bent birch bark um, strips to make a gunnel to support the fabric kayak. And then I also painted the ends. And it's kind of cool now that that is an, inside the cloth kayak, the caning shows through just a little bit with the translucency of the silk. I'm gonna finish the kayak this weekend. This is it yesterday. And lastly, this is my installation from earlier this week. This show opened yesterday and it's called Bog Etudes. This shows an overview of the whole gallery where it is in downtown Minneapolis. This shows the piece on the left in relationship to the pieces that hang in the center of the gallery. And I find this slide kind of interesting. On the left is looking at the pieces from the front of the gallery and 
on the right side, this is looking from the back of the gallery towards the door. And the one on the left looks much more transparent because of the lighting. And then the lighting on the right side shows the pieces as looking more solid. And you can see the differences of tones and color between each piece better with that lighting. So here's all the ways to connect with me. It's always pretty much my first and last name. The uh, QR code at the bottom is my link tree and it always has my current links on there. So I hope you found something interesting in the presentation. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And it was my pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Moira. I, thank you, Moira. I, uh, whoa it was so amazing so like i was just writing down things that you were saying and so you started out with remnant prairie i've never heard that word before vernal pool i have but you're so geographically located it's amazing so like your first 30 seconds of speech were something like remnant prairie vernal pool Oak Savannah and Lake of the Little Tree Spirits. I mean, how much more beautiful can that be? <laughs> and then you started talking about diatomatic fossils and paleolimnologists and fossils and boundary waters and portage. And it was like, oh my God, this is so incredible. Because like all of your dialogue and your work were just so, so closely intertwined. It was like you were reciting this epic poem to us as you were showing us images. It was really beautiful. I don't think you knew you were doing that, but you were. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's all fun stuff. And that's why I immerse myself in it. It makes yeah. my work interesting and that's why I do it. So can I just jump in with a question and then I'm going to turn it over to Amy. So how did you get connected with all these scientists? Residencies that I applied for. Uh -huh. Well, one, yeah, the scientists, that was a residency that I applied for. It was a residency with a science organization? It's the St. Croix Watershed Research Station. It is a great residency. I think they probably still do it. Um, it's associated with the research station and the Science Museum of Minnesota, which are connected. Uh -huh. And the artist gets to stay on site in a little cabin on the edge of the St. Croix River and have total access to the laboratories, the scientists, the library there, the forests, the river. That oh sounds goodness. just really horrible. Weird. That sounds Yeah. Like a what a drag. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you survived it. Yeah. Apply. It's really terrific. It sounds well, amazing. All right. I'm going to turn no. it over to Amy before I like grab you into like one-on-one -on -one conversation. Here. I know, I, I said on uh, Wednesday, I'm, I'm heading there and I'm, I'm ready to go canoeing and storytelling and hanging out. Yes. Um, Kathy, you just said something that you made me think of. Uh, it'll come, oh, well, I guess, I thought it was really interesting too, Kathy, what you're saying and then kind of segueing in a little bit with like, how did you get these, how did you meet all the scientists? But I think what you're doing is so interesting too, when we're talking about our work as natural dyers and whether it's your job or you just your, your hobby, but being able to partner with people outside of the choir of textiles and art and stuff and actually being able to collaborate with artists. I mean, a scientist is just such a powerful, powerful thing. And please everybody start finding more scientists. Okay, I'm gonna jump into the questions. Um, let's see, what type of fabric are you using? I use piece silk. So I believe it's a Tessa silk. And I have some airy silk, but I mostly use the Tessa. Okay. And how do you wax the fabric? Um, I just, I just basically um, spread it on with um, either a brush or um, a roller. And does it take a long time for, for it to dry after you do that? Maybe about a day. Oh, all right. Let's see. Um, did you mordant your fabric? Beautiful project, says Susan. Yeah, I came into this not as a textile person, just, just an experimenter. <laughs> so no, uh, looking back at a lot of the photos and opportunities I had, I wish I would have, but I've got time left now. And so I'm kind of learning to figure that out now. 
Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. You know, if I could just interject, if, if you're doing a um, pan and iron reaction, you don't necessarily need to mordant. I mean, only if you're trying to achieve mm. really dark, you know, like if there was a red shade that was somewhere in the, the colorations that you're looking for or something like that. I, 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 the other thing I'm thinking is that, you know, you're trying to do the least amount of intervention with other chemicals and that mordantine, even though mordantine is generally accepted as safe, um, you know, in your environmental and very delicate ecosystems, you may mm -hmm. choose to not mordant because yeah, of the potential. Just, yeah, I did one. I should have said I also the ten ecotypes I went through the state. There were also DNR scientific and natural area. Those were DNR natural scientific and natural areas, and I did partner with them as well for that project. And I had to apply with the DNR to leave my fabric in their sites because their research scientific research sites like those prairies and that oak savanna. Um, and I told them I was putting nothing on the cloth. It would just be the cloth. Mm -hmm. But looking back, if maybe not for those sites, but putting tannin on ahead of time, especially if I'm looking for iron, is a good idea, I think. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Linda Watson wants to know, the bags into which you stuffed the fabric and left in the lake, what did you call them? Thought I heard a special name and did you make them yourself? Yeah, those are chum bags. I didn't make them, but they work really well because they don't deteriorate their nylon and they are made for uh, baiting fish, I think in the ocean. So they're really sturdy. The nice thing is I can lash them to something on the shore and they've, they're pretty much always there when I come back. I did lose one at Prune Lake that the the um, strap had been chewed. It looked like something like a beaver just cut it off. So I'm expecting it's still in the lake and I may go back and just look for it. It's not that big a lake. Okay. Mm -hmm. You get some scuba diving equipment on and, and uh... <laughs> Moira. Uh, okay. Linda says, Moira, I raised my kids 20 feet from the St. Croix River right in the town of Marine. I now live in Roseville and will be visiting your show at the gallery. That's exciting. Awesome. Okay. Um, people saying lots of nice things. Okay. It's lovely to attend today. I am in Headwaters Bog Country, north of you by uh, Bemidji. 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 Okay. Bemidji. Yeah, awesome. Do the minerals set the color naturally or do you need a mordant? We just we just talked about the mordant, sorry, but how about just talking about the color, maybe how the color is sort of making its marks on the fabric. Like when you have it all crumpled up, like when you were pulling it out of that bag, Moira, I was thinking the same thing. It's I guess it's just sort of working its way inside it and as well as all around it. And do you find that it leaves kind of pockets of silt in different places? Yes, it does. And I try to leave it sort of as uncrumpled as I can when I first put it in, but it does over time, it crumples up and those, I respect those crumples and those wrinkles. Those are the wrinkles mm -hmm. I want to stay in the work when I finish it. Um, yeah. I know you were talking I think the tannin is, you know, using tannin was what was going to re respond to the minerals, right, Kathy? Yeah. Okay. When we were talking on Wednesday, you were saying like when you do the like the like what's on the left of you right now, where you where you actually cut things out, use your circle your circle cutter. <laughs> but what are you and your or you're making those squares too? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're are you, you're sort of piecing it all out based on where the the silt and the mud has has made their marks on the fabric, and that becomes part of your art as well. Or is it just that you're leaving it as is and just piecing it together like a puzzle. I've done both. Yeah. And recently the pieces, the bog etude pieces, I've enjoyed cutting it first and then putting it in the mud. Um, I find that then it makes um, deteriorations on the, the cut edges too, because it's mm -hmm. really different to have a really clean cut, which is something that I've always really liked clean cuts. A lot of my work has just really straight, perfect cuts. Yeah. 
but I can do those perfect cuts and then let the mud have action on it. And I, I'm really enjoying that. Wow, that's great. I know I've asked this question about the wax, but what kind of wax do you use? Somebody's asking. Yeah, it's a mixed, it's a, it's a medium with a mixture of waxes in it. I like the next thing just says, I hope you avoided the black flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how do people know to stop and leave your items that you placed in the ponds alone? Do they see them? They probably don't see them. I think those dark bags being underwater are kind of murky, although there tend to be a, a line that is attached somewhere. I always put a little tag up there just saying my name and number and then I'm coming back to get it but I don't know I, I have a feeling <laughs> you don't really see it yeah I would that'd be funny to find to find this little note from you just kind of hanging out in the water <laughs> oh that's cute let's see um the this work is uh the work is such a signature of place so beautiful are there other geographical areas around the country or around the world that you'd like to explore yeah, I would love to explore other places. I actually, I actually have not done that yet. I mean, especially bogs. I know there are bogs in Scandinavia and in, um, I think there's bogs or at least peatlands in Ireland. Um, I would love to search for more bogs wherever they are. Yeah. I was kind of trolling your Instagram page yesterday or the day before, and I saw that you had a map of, I forgot where it was. It was from where your mother's from. Where was that? Hardanger. And you were going back and it was some tiny little island. Mm -hmm. Hardanger Fjord, Norway. So it's, yeah. So I marked the little tiny island where they were from that's in the middle of Hardanger Fjord. Yeah. Did you do some, yeah. some experiments or like looking in for um, silt? I'm going this summer. So that's what I want to, I got um, a natural dyer that I'm going to connect with in Hardanger Fjord to kind of find out what tannins they use. If, yeah. If there are iron soils or just things about did, Hardanger and Norway. Did you find the natural dyer just like how did I, I love the I love finding out how natural dyers meet and then finding the in like different different countries and then being able to do projects together or just take a walk together. How did you find this person? There was a folk museum, just a small one in Hardanger Fjord and I messaged them about it and they sent me a name. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Michelle says, sign me up for foraging these lands and waters. This has been the most interesting. Is this peat that you experiment with? Where can we find more info about these studies or your processes? Because you were talking about peat bogs. That's why I think Michelle's talking about peat. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information about peat out there. Um, there's a website called eco art space that um, work with artists that are all concentrating on the environment. And I know that they have some projects involving peatland all over the world that are on that, that you can access through that website. Mm. Your website itself too is great just to just, just see, you know, what's going on with your own work and, and how people can follow you, which is all on the RSVP and it will all be on the video post that we put up. Um, let's see. I am wondering if Maura has seen the new University of Minnesota Alumni Magazine, which is all about the research going on at the U on water here in Minnesota. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, no. sounds... yeah. More studies. Let's see. Does the color fade in your artworks? Does the color ever mostly disappear? No, the color hasn't been fading. I, I, I mean, isn't tannin and iron pretty durable? It, it doesn't really fade. And maybe the waxing helps that too. Um, uh, iron is durable, <laughs> super durable. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. only if you have a, a very acidic en environment that you would have any um, action on the iron that would be kind of a re reversal, if you will. So yeah, iron, iron and tannin is um, pretty durable. Should not be afraid of, I mean, like all colors, you wanna take care of it, but you shouldn't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, because these questions have no rhyme or reason, I'm, I'm jumping around here. But a couple of people have asked if you use beeswax. It's, it's got some beeswax in it. It's a mixture. Okay. Okay, Kate is saying, how do you clean the mud off the fabric? Do you, do you, is it, oh, do you write in the place that you pulled it? Do you, maybe do you remove it? Do you clean it right in the place where you pulled it? Um, Actually, I'm not quite sure I answered, I, I know this. How about we just talk to, you talk to, how do you clean the mud off of the fabric? Yeah, sometimes I, sometimes I clean it off and, and sometimes I've just partially cleaned it off, maybe with a soft brush. So I don't, I just let the pieces that are really in the fiber stay on. And then lately I've, and previously I also did this, just leave it on. Mm. Probably like just seasons it a little bit or something kind of. As part of the piece. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did you notice any degradation of the silk fabric when left in marine in the marine environment for long periods? Yes, especially um, when I've left fabric in larger rivers that are probably more polluted uh, from urban and agricultural runoff, then I do get holes a lot more and really quickly. But it mm -hmm. could also be from the turbidity of the water, just action on the on the fabric. Okay. Um, have you incorporated human interventions such as rusty metal bits into your work? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. That doesn't give me enough time to find the next question, Moira. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see, how or why do you choose specific time frames to leave the cloth in the lakes or bogs? Ex um, example, why a year and not a month? Well, I had done a month quite a bit. Um, I thought it would be interesting to try a whole year. Did you see a difference in that between a month and a year? Yeah, a lot more holes, um, darker colors. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever put plants wrapped in the fabric before you put it in the water or the or soil to dye? I did when I first started out, um, but I don't do that anymore. Okay. Kathy just put a link in there about, um, she said there's a lot of focus on peatland protection and restoration, especially in Scotland. And uh, a link to it there. Somebody's at talking about peatlands. Okay. Does um, does the wax help nullify the corrosiveness of iron? I think it might. I think it's protective. And I certainly feel just as an artist versus technical science stuff about that, I feel that the action of waxing it is a protective. The whole process to me is a process of nurturing when I when I wax the fabric, when I take it out of, you know, when you saw what it looks like when I get it from a lake, it looks like. Mm -hmm somebody would find it they would probably throw it away so I yeah. feel like a lot of it is a nurturing and act of caring and the waxing for me is part of that as well mm -hmm. is iron abrasive on silk I think it probably is yeah I can I just interject of course um <laughs> so I, I... <laughs> I think the amount of iron we're talking about is low enough where you're not going to see like instant holes in your textiles. And, and even if you do see some abrasion or degradation, it's, I think it's part of your process and your intention. So, um, you know, you're, you're not trying to make something that you're next going to make a dress out of, right? You're trying to show what the relationship is between this particular location and this piece of fabric and time um you know when which are where you're going to see iron really impact is in like on uh, animal fibers such as wool where it'll become very harsh and brittle but i mean we're talking typically at least decades and sometimes hundreds of years so i don't think for for us it's as I mean, definitely it's going to happen chemically, but I don't know that it's an immediate concern. And certainly, Moira, I don't think it's really, I mean, it's an intention for you. Mm -hmm. So it, it's an okay thing at this point. Yeah. 
Where will you talk about, because um, I thought it was so interesting when you were, that picture you had, you're with the scientists out on the, on that boat and they pulled up that sample. I, in, I feel like you said it was around, I could be wrong, like an eight foot like that big sample that you got was just hundreds of years of, of sediment from the bottom of a pond or a lake. Can you, can you talk about just that experience? Like what, what actually happened? Yeah. Well, it was trickier than you might even think. They had the tube and just lowering it completely, you know, anchoring the boat in the middle of the lake. We went, I can't remember how far below the water we went, but it was significant. I would think it was 15 to 20 feet down through the water. And then I, I don't remember exactly. There must have been some contraption for pushing because mm -hmm. pushed we, there, were, there must have been a pole or something, but it was pushed down, down, down at the base of the water um, and then pulled up. And it was, I remember there were tricky things about getting it capped when it came up and um, keeping it capped and intact they didn't want um maybe air or water to get in to the top um as it was coming up or all these things it was it's pretty cool probably so it wouldn't kind of come out maybe come out the bottom too but what did they were they doing it for you or were they doing it as part of some project they, that they, they do it all the time that's how they get their samples that they um they look at the diatoms in each layer and so then when we got it back one time I went with them we at the edge of the lake they just started separating it and that takes quite a while they have to get up on a ladder and then they push it down and take tiny samples and they collect each little tiny sliver in a little vial and mark it so that then they they dry it out they save all those they take tiny samples of that and that's what they look at under a microscope they also had I didn't really pursue this part of it, but it might be involved in the aging. They had, uh, maybe there's somebody sciencey here, but it, it had like a, um, some kind of nuclear or radi radiation testing room that, mm. that um, they could carbon date um, things. So they were also doing that to know the age of probably the layers. Was there anything that came from it that just what just kind of blew you away any information they had from that sample or that sounded just that was really interesting to you yeah I found it interesting that they could see how the diatom the types of diatoms and the numbers of each type of diatom corresponded to things they knew happened around the lake so the first sub settlements of um, white settlers coming around the lake and then maybe I think it was something like a a new septic system at a restaurant on the edge of the lake and that mm -hmm. has right? And then new septic systems being put in, they could see the health getting better, really coinciding exactly with the diatoms in each level. Yeah, that's interesting. And I know when we were talking to, just because you said diatoms a couple of times and I, um, well, you were talking about how much that the shapes really inspired you. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Like the, the diatoms themselves, when you first saw them, how it inspired your artwork? Yeah, well, they're, they're undeniably just beautiful. They're made of glass and they are, have beautiful patterns. They're very, tend to be very symmetrical. So I haven't used them as much in my work um, unless I just um, use them coming into a piece or going out or or abstract it to not be so symmetrical, but um, I've seen artists that do make art with exact diatoms and some I think can be colorful. Um, they're just really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I know I, I went looking after, I've got like all these bookmarks now on diatom, bookmarks on diatoms. I think I had I called them something else and you, which was funny, but um, let's see. Oh yeah. Good question. When you laid the fabric on the rocks, did you have to repeatedly wet, I guess, wet the fabric or just let nature take its course? And also how long was it out there? You're talking about the rock rubbings. Is that what you had said? Well, or the, the lake of the little tree spirits, the water. And they were laid out on that rock. Yeah. 
fabric at the lake of the little tree spirits was in the lake for about a month and then I had just pulled it out and laid it on the rock and then took the photo on Lake Superior that's something I only did that one time and I it wasn't natural I just used some um, those water those fabric watercolor pencils basically and just put the fabric on the really interesting rock outcroppings and just rub to wow. get and that was just a fun little side project I think well that sounds like fun it's always good to interpret nature and in, in different ways and just have a fresh fresh look on on color and nature and the connection of it um uh, more is it more are you familiar with annie hedgney's work twin cities artist she paints with water sediments annie, yeah she's a friend of mine <laughs> sorry <laughs> <Her studio. laughs> don't tell her i said her name like that She's in the building here. Her studio is on a different floor. Oh, yeah, cool. Perfect. Uh, kind of down to the bottom of the questions here, but there was one. Oh, darn. Oh, somebody, um, Joan had asked, why, why do you use silk instead of, say, something like a cotton? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think when I got started, I was just attracted to the texture of silk. I can't, it was a decision yeah. made a long time ago, not knowing a whole lot, but I just grabbed some silk and I, I loved the texture and the feel of it. I think I love that it's so beautiful in itself. And if it's representing the landscape or being part of these amazing places, I love it that it's the most, to me, maybe the most beautiful fabric. I'm making these beautiful, beautiful portraits of these places. Um, but at the same time, seeing the fragility and destruction and the decomposition of that same fabric. Also, I, I get peace silk and I just love it that it's organic and fair trade and it's um, the moths aren't, aren't killed. Mm. Uh, so I just love the fabric I use. Mm. That's fair. Let's see. Um... Nice, this is a good one too. Thanks, Mary. Um, more, there've been many questions about technique. And so what would you like us to take away about your work and your project? Well, I think that these um, amazing wild places are out there and um, they're something we should all be thinking about and learning about and protecting. Mm. Yeah, okay. It's perfect. I feel like we should just sort of like, like end on that, but there's all of a sudden everybody starts putting in a new little, little things here. Kathy, do you have any questions at all? Oh, I have so many questions, but I know. I'm not going to ask them, but I, you know, I think, I think Mara, that's so true is like, this is such a beautiful way of participating and even intervening in an environmental place, but your, your, your impact is fairly minimal because you're not pre-treating the fabric you're leaving it there you're not you know agitating or actively trying to ex excavate mud or green things or anything out of the environment you're just letting it be there with it and then you're you're taking it out and and seeing what it did I, I just think that that's it's it's such a beautiful kind of non-violent way of of participating and yet honoring that space without having to um, extract, I guess, is the best way to say it. I, I really admire that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I should say that I do have those buckets of bog mud and I was very- Yeah, happy. but- I took, but from, I took them from a, a, a right of way near the bog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The higher tracks from- Yeah. The yeah. And, and, you know, you're being extremely mindful, right, of where you're gathering the resource and how you're using it. And like the, the core sample that the scientists took, you know, you're able to reuse that. I think that's, that's all good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely, I loved the class with Abu Bakr Fofana last summer where he was going around and just collecting all the little pieces of mud that were stray and, and putting them back mm -hmm. in his bucket. And now I'm, I do that too now. I'm, I loved that. Yeah. 
All right. Um, you know, I want to read this to you because it's always good to hear something like this. So um, I'm a social scientist at an environmental science and forestry school. My research partner is in landscape architecture. I really appreciate how your work merges art and science through a focus on water and place. We are forever reminding the biophysical scientists of the value of art and the humanities in communicating science, climate, water, place to the general public. I can't wait to share your work with my students, Moira. It's brilliant. So mm -hmm. see, that's like, that's wonderful. That's like, uh, that's where you want it to go to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I will say at the University of Minnesota, when I studied landscape architecture, that's how our program was. We were highly active in the landscape ecology department. And, um, and since I also concentrated in studio art, uh, it was perfect blending of those right from the beginning for me with my education. All right. Well, hopefully everybody's now going to start using their natural dyeing to start talking about water in their communities so we can all start thinking about how we can be better water stewards and thinking about things like when you mentioned septic systems, when a new one came in on a pond and the scientists could see that because of some change in the sediment. I mean, there's so many ways we as artists can start tackling environmental issues and water is the big one. So, so think about different ways you can, you can use what you do and get involved in your communities, please. This is my public service announcement. And now, thank you, Moira, and um, on to Kathy. <laughs> Maura, I don't really have much more to say, but that, oh, what a wonderful way to start the new year and um, just learn about a really, really mindful and beautiful project. I, I saw, I don't know, I guess when you were emailing me about how to ferment the mud, I think I just went to your website and I saw that those, that those two pieces and I was like, I said to Amy, oh, you should talk to her. Oh, yeah. She's got some really interesting stuff going on. It was great. So thank yes. you very much for joining us. And it looks like we've got everybody here. Um, we can open it up to say hello and chat a bit, and then we'll say goodbye. Um, anything else, Amy? Have I left anything off? I want you to imagine yourselves on the island of Volcano, in the, in the little town of 862 people, Volcano Hawaii. I want you to imagine yourselves wearing flowing naturally dyed dresses with hibiscus in your hair, drinking citrus <laughs> drinks by a waterfall, and, and hanging out with Sasha Dor, Kathy and I, as we eat farm to table and do dyeing. So I just, just again, just let that- We, we need hiking boots too, because we're gonna go to Volcano National hike. Park. We're gonna see volcano, <laughs> we're gonna see lava flows. We're gonna- we're Hopefully gonna we see... won't. <laughs> no, I won't. I would like to see that. I'm apparently hiking at night to see that, but come on. This is the this is the trip of a trip of the of, of a lifetime here. Thursday, be there or be square to sign up. 15 people. It'll be fun. Yeah. And, and if you're a Hawaii resident, we have um, scholarship available for uh, Hawaii residents. So We'll have that link available on Thursday as well. And you can sign up and uh, yeah, we hope we, we you can join us. Um, we do have a couple other really amazing experiences happening that we're still organizing. Uh, one is of course, Takayuki Ishii that I spoke about earlier. And then um, Maura spoke about Abu Bakar Fofana and he's coming back as well in the month of July. And he will be um, stationed, let's see, Billeted, I don't know, a good word. He'll be in <laughs> Santa Fe, New Mexico uh, for the month of July teaching there. So the, um, the environment is really incredible for both indigo and mineral mud um, workshop. And he's also doing an extended um, construction workshop where you're basically gonna be able to make the garment of your choice, but there's three choices. And that is um, a pair of um, strip cloth trousers, uh, a kimono as many did last year or a tunic. So if you have ever wanted to work with the indigenous fabrics and indigenous colors of, um, it's 
going to be both New Mexico and Mali, then uh, it's an opportunity for you. And Amy's going to be down there. And our good friend, um, Marty Howe is going to be down there. And of course, Abu Bakar. It's going to be pretty amazing. Do you have right. the dates for that? Um, I don't have specific dates um, yet. We're still organizing it, but we're, we plan to open it, I believe, um, in a couple of weeks. So you'll be able to see what those opportunities are as well. Yeah. It will be month, July, the month of July. Incredible. Like what Moira was saying, the, that class was pretty mind-blowing to see how how that um i've never seen anything like that before the mud reacting with the uh, ingalama is that what you call it kathy uh-huh yeah. the yellow yeah. tannin yeah. and then we also use cherry ops which yeah, it's beautiful. which is also on sale on the site right now for sale on the site the cherry ops that's like seasoned and ready to go and it's the most gorgeous brown it's so yeah. beautiful it's a pretty color oh yeah all right guys anything else so good to see all of you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. If you guys want to say thank you to Moira and yeah, Moira. Thank you. Moira. Deepest thanks. Moira. Thank you, Moira. Very nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Thank you. 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 Thank you.